All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator for today, Lizzie Goodman. for being here. It's been a long time coming, but we're really excited to actually be here doing this and to see all of your faces in real life, <laughs> which is a miracle that we're now here. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Wow. Well, that made me feel really welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to grab my seat and, and bring the guys out and you're going to see, you know, members of Nine Inch Nails, past and present, and hopefully a few very exciting surprise faces. So, yeah, With, without further ado, let's do it. Trent and Atticus and Robin and Elon. Yay! And Alessandro and Chris. And Danny. <laughs> Wait for everyone. And also Rich and Charlie are here. Yay. Sign seats and everything. We took a while working that out. <laughs> so yeah, thank you everyone who's on stage now for being here as well. This is really awesome. Um, so I, I did just want to start by asking this guy to my left right here, uh, Mr. Trent Reznor, to talk a bit about sort of what we're doing here today. I mean, this has been, I think you and I first talked about this event, the theoretical version of this event two years ago when you guys were inducted and or knew you were going to be inducted and now we're actually here but it's been as I said earlier a bit of a long time coming and um, now we're actually here and all these faces are on stage and you know why why was this important to do in person in this way with all of these um, friends and colleagues yeah first of all thanks for coming out we're glad to, glad to finally be here after however many years. Um, no, the reality of it is when, when we were, when we had the privilege of being inducted into Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, quite honestly, my issue was I, s I start from a place of cynicism and kind of eye roll and I, I hesitate to look backwards with, um, I think it's dangerous, kind of. So I started off, you know, flattered that we were uh, part of this, but kind of, you know, when you see the list of bands that aren't in it, you can justify why, and it's awful shit, you know. <laughs> and I think um, having some time to think about it and maturing a bit and realizing that um, part of being present and acknowledging things was, hey, this, this is actually pretty cool, yeah. you know, and there's nothing wrong with kind of feeling okay about being... Um, Acknowledged, you know, and as I thought about that and thought about Nine Inch Nails, you know, it's not just me and it never has been just me. Uh, there was a battle to see who could be included in the induction with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and there were some tough decisions made and fights uh, initiated. But I, I thought it was um, important that. Go it on, it no. <laughs> you know, that it, that it was a, a group accomplishment, you know, and the idea when. W the original uh, ceremony was going to take place is that we'd get together everybody that's been a part of it and kind of just have a minute to say nice job you know and 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 be able to appreciate something that we've all everyone here has greatly contributed to um, COVID had other plans for us and then we talked about doing it the next year and similar situation and when we just played these handful of shows and we were coming through Cleveland we thought hey let's um Let's take a minute to pause for a second and have a, a guilt-free couple hours of um, acknowledging something that um, you know, certainly has meant a lot to me, and I'm, I'm appreciative to have these guys be a part of. So 
We've been friendly throughout the years. I thought it'd be nice to have everyone come up and just yeah. acknowledge and feel okay about it for a yeah. while. You know, it's, it's <laughs> in, in How long do we have to feel okay about it, would you say? Like, it's an, well, a clock or dinner we'll go till 5 p.m. Okay, please. cool. <laughs> I just want everyone to be on the same page about how long good feelings are allowed to last. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, obviously we are in Cleveland, which is um, a place you have lived before, and many, or at least a few people on this stage have also uh, lived before, and there's a shared history here with Nine Inch Nails and with, um, with the band and, and with this place. Um, so I did want, I wanted to start with Chris, um, <laughs> who's looking at me like, you monster. Um, <laughs> But I'm sorry, it's just like this is the, okay. you know, you've known this guy a long time, you were roommates. I, I have so, m I could spend this entire conversation just asking about what it's like to be trans roommate and telling all the secrets. Does he leave his towels on the floor? Like what's some of the, um, but in all seriousness, like I think, you know, for, for those of us who love Nine Inch Nails, thinking about the early years and the kind of the Pretty Hate Machine era and um, the writing of that record and, and that time and place here, um, is significant. It's, it's, you know, you love this band, you think about that time, among others, and I know you, you were here and are a part of that, and so I was wondering if you could just speak a little to a any memory that comes up of that time, especially in the context of sitting here now thinking about the legacy of this band, which is a dangerous word. I don't mean legacy like past, I just mean honoring the magic of Nine Inch Nails that is certainly ongoing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is kind of a homecoming, uh, trying to yeah. ever actually comparing uh, the view out of our hotel windows, like if we could spot our old apartment that we lived in, in like 87 or 88, whenever that was. Wow. And, um, but yeah, this, this place was always home. I mean, that's where it started. Uh, I remember Trent writing in the basement of a friend's house, uh, Tom, and, and the original four track demos. And, and then, uh, uh, we were offered an opportunity to open for this band, Skinny Puppy. You know, you know that, but, and um, we, you know, we had never even looked at trying to play a lot at that point. And it was like, okay, it was, it was like a s Sunday or something. It was like, okay, well, your first show's Wednesday. And it was like, uh, okay, what are we gonna do? And so we, we ended up going out on, the, on that tour in 88 Vivis X6, driving around in his car and just going up and down the East Coast opening for Skinny Puppy. Some of the greatest memories. Roach-ridden motels and gooey floors. Oh God, it was <laughs> some gross stuff. But um, yeah, there's something about this this city as, as well that it's it's just kind of where we because we're Pennsylvania boys too. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like the place where you grew up and got your start is always special, always. What kind of car? <laughs> what kind of car is that? You <laughs> he had a red Civic. I had a blue Civic. <laughs> So is Destiny, obviously, matching <laughs> civics. Uh, the future of all great, the, the history of all great rock and roll stories starts that way, I think. Um, and s Chris, uh, you're, you're off the hook very soon, I swear, unless you decide to jump in later. But I do, I do just want to know a bit about like, what it's like to, I mean, you're teaching now. You're Professor Vrenna. Um, so, uh, he's, he's, uh, this is the worst part for you. Yeah, I know, I it's almost over. But I do have to know <laughs> a bit about... <laughs> Just, yeah, like how do you, from where you sit, given that this is a retrospective moment, like does that person in the civic connect to this person who's doing this teaching thing for like young minds yeah, and so absolutely. on? Absolutely, that's actually why I got into teaching several years ago. So I'm a college professor, I teach music technology, but um, it's because of this that I do that because when we were really young getting started, um, some of the people we got to work with throughout our career, people like Flood, um, and, and learning from them and, and watching them work is it's kind of how how it's passed down you, you know what I'm saying so um, I hit a, a certain dark point in my life and it, to get out of it I was like you know what I need to start sharing like like people shared with us I need to share that with the next group of 20 somethings that want to try to accomplish what we managed to accomplish um, and it became really important for me as a thing to do so that's that's why I actually do it. Awesome. <laughs> Everyone should take his class, clearly. Um, yeah. I want to <laughs> take his class. Um, so in keeping a bit with the, the Cleveland theme, which is ongoing, I, I want to ask Rich a bit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Danny is like, hey, he's next. Um, no, but I mean, 
again, sort of in a way, some of the same themes come up, like just thinking about, well, let's start with how, if I asked you, how does your Nine Inch Nails story begin? What would you say? Like, what's the origin point for you? I am my band, the act opened up for the band, the Exotic Birds. Okay. And, <laughs> and, um, I needed some equipment at a place called Pi Keyboards and Audio, and I, that's where I met you. And we officially like met. Your, the manager had said that I looked like your little brother, or something like that. <laughs> and I was like, "Yep, I get that a lot, but a lot with Trent." Um, but uh, did you meet in the store? Yeah, we, that yeah. was where like, we kind you? of officially okay. met at the Pi Keyboards and Audio. And then he was putting the band together, and I had gone through my own thing because I was trying to get the act off the ground. And we had gotten turned down from a, a, a record label, and I started listening to a lot of Skinny Puppy and Ministry. And, uh, and he goes, what's gotten into you lately? What's, what's going on with you? And I said, I just listened to Skinny Puppy and Ministry. I don't really, my world is dark, leave me alone. <laughs> And he was like, I think I have something you might be interested in. It's called Nine Inch Nails. And I was like, fucking A, sounds awesome. <laughs> then he played me his, he played me, most of the record was already completed. And it was unbelievable. He played me head like a hole and it was just like, this is a fucking huge hit. It's a mess. Sorry to swear. I think, I think swearing is allowed. But this I is was, our party. We, you know. Yeah. Um, but I was just like, this is going to be gigantic. You know, I just immediately heard it like, thought it was awesome. And then he played me down in it too. The Adrian Sherwood remixes and it was just like this is insane. Do you remember that, Trent? Those moments? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. <laughs> this is just I'm just fact checking. I'm not saying you have to elaborate. I just want to make sure we're getting, you know, the order of operations correct here. Um, yeah. No, Rich Rich's band was good and the, the Axis in Cleveland here was like the fantasy nightclub. Mm. And when yeah. bands we were all in would be encountering each other and I needed to put together some way to finish out the band and have it play live and present it after having learned from our throw, let's throw it together to open for Skinny Puppy <laughs> mishap and I needed someone like Rich you know to, to anchor the thing so um, Rich of course obviously you went on and did lots of other things after Nine Inch Nails and are continuing to do those things I mean it, uh, there's a new filter album coming is that yes, right yes there is yes it's amazing yeah Thank congratulations you. um that was nice of you <laughs> what did you say i said that was nice of you well no <laughs> <laughs> yeah it better be good now because like the pressure <laughs> it is. It is. it's but no so it's coming out next year and yes um, this spring this spring okay there's a new song coming out next week I that's think. exactly yeah. what i was gonna ask yeah, yeah. And I mean, I know there is some repetitive themes here, and I apologize to everyone on stage for that and everyone in the audience too, but it's inevitable. I mean, I do wonder, like, given that we're here, like, do you think about the sort of present with everything you're doing creatively, including Filter, as being connected to this era? Do they seem like two different lives, or is there like, oh yeah, that guy from that era, from that music store is connected to the, to the 2023 God, that's really, it's a year to say out loud, but um, <laughs> album that's coming out. Like, do those things feel related to you? Can you I see think the connection? It's, I, th I think it's all about just sticking true to your guns and making music mm -hmm. that blows your mind. Because if you, if you don't believe in yourself, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you end up just kind of putting something out that's not really truly from your heart. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just try and focus on that. And that, started way back when, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that was, I mean, when I had gotten turned down by a record company, I, the first uh -huh. person I called was Trent. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, what music are you listening to? Because <laughs> I was turned down because I sounded too much like you two. Oh. And, and I was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> I was like 17 and, you know, emotional and shit. And, um... <laughs> Tore down my Bono poster, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he goes, because you should listen to some new music, man. That's what, that's what your problem is. And then my friend Dave Slay came over with the record Land of Rape and Honey, and it was wow. like that was it. Wow. 
Okay. Yeah. That was so really you had to sacrifice the, the Bono love in order mm-hmm. to move in, on with your life. Okay, cool. Got it. Um, <laughs> okay, Robin. Hi. <laughs> I, just, I just, I wanted, yes, it's, I think it's on. Um, so I just wanted to ask you really, you're the longest touring member of Nine Inch Nails, which is a pretty cool honor. Um, what, how did your story begin? Like, what is the, what is the beginning? And, and when I say that, I also just sort of mean both creatively on a personal level, but also um, given that you come into the story at least slightly later, um, what, what the band has meant to you um, as, a, as a musician back then and certainly, certainly in your personal life too, like when it started for you? Well, for, for context, I was three years out of high school mm-hmm. and uh, playing in a bunch of bands around Atlanta, up and down uh, south to Texas, maybe as far north as Baltimore. <laughs> right. And um, I was getting concerned <laughs> that I was going to do another, you know, year four after high school and year f- and I was starting to feel um, I needed to find a new um, setting and a new uh, trajectory. And uh, I was living at the Masquerade, uh, the big the, um, gothic music club that had local bands all week long and then maybe on the weekend a national act would come through and uh-huh. pulling a uh, trailer or maybe on a tour bus and they'd be <laughs> pushing the rack gear in with the... <laughs> um, the dream. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I had applied to Berkeley College of Music. Wow. And I wasn't really excited about it at all. Mm-hmm. But I was as I say, kind of concerned. And um, with the people I was surrounded by and where I was kind of, what I was not doing, really. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just go somewhere and finally figure out how to really play this thing, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we know uh, that part worked out, so. And the the owner of the club called me up to his office and uh, told me he got a call from um, Jerry Gerard, a... uh, Yeah, an agent from the, you know, rep from the group saying that uh, he was one of three calls that was received, phone calls, uh, that Nine Inch Nails was looking for a guitar player. Oh. And um, wasn't a casting call, wasn't a wide net. They wanted to know, is there someone... Kind of on the down low, on the inside. Yeah, that, cool. that really we, um, we, we should meet. He said, you should go. I said, oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> I think that's, uh, isn't that a lot of black hair and synthesizers? And, um, <laughs> Correct, yeah. Um, you were against that at this time in your no, life? No, I wasn't. Ag- I was, I was uh, you know, sure I wouldn't fit in. Uh-huh. You know, it was in Cal- What were you I, wearing? I, I needed era. to go I mean, to California just, to meet uh-huh. them. I'd never been to California. Oh, so. well, I see. What were you wearing? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you brought yeah. this up. Uh, uh, actually, um, a pair of red patent leather Doc Martens that are half size too small for my feet, you know, okay. but they... Yeah. <laughs> they did the trick. Um, so you I, flew so to I, Cal- I borrowed $50, $60 from everybody I knew to... Wow. After going to the library to sit with the um, Betamax, uh, you know video console and the jog wheel to put a a tape together and put it in the manila envelope and send it off um and then what happened so (laughs) (laughs) So because you know you are in nine inch nails now (laughs) and have been for quite some time (laughs) something worked out so um so I made the trip. It was it was a um, great adventure to get to yeah. California um, to meet these guys. Yeah. I plugged. I walked into the room at SIR and plugged into an amp as tall as I was for wow. the first time in my life. 
and um, they were um, there was a couch pit behind uh, you know some some like kind of like this where uh, park hands in my eyes I couldn't see the shadowy figures they'd been seeing people you know fi every 15 minutes or something um, and there was some there was a uh, small PA we uh, I played alone through uh, several of the songs and um, Nine Inch Nails songs like you played oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. some of the songs I was asked to uh, uh -huh. drum up and then we moved to um, maybe you could play some of the songs that we didn't ask you to drum up and we mm -hmm. kind of wor worked through those wow um, <laughs> I don't know how to speed this up here uh, <laughs> <laughs> We, we eventually, uh, <laughs> this was in San Francisco, and uh, uh, the, the flight was, my flight return home to Atlanta was uh, rerouted to, uh, <laughs> to Hollywood, where, where we all kind of. Did you ever go back together. to Atlanta? Like, yeah. did you? Okay. I'm just in the movie version of this, you know, with the bright, I mean, you're really painting a picture, yeah. you know, and there's like, you can't see anyone and you've got your, it's like a Dorothy situation with your shoes. And then, yeah. then the next thing you know, you just never go home again. And here you are. It's a That's couple what it decades feels like later. to me right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I mean, I, the only other thing I would, I would just ask that I, to you is that, I mean, there's a million things I could ask you, but one that keeps popping up is, and we talked a bit earlier today about the work you're doing with your video game company and, and the developing of alternate reality and as something you're obviously interested in and in that space, but you're, I mean, you're incredible on stage, right? Like it's just, you're incredible on stage and there's such a obvious, from the outside at least, kind of transcendence and performance aspect to what you do and I guess my question you don't have to I mean take this wherever you want but are those things connected like do you feel a sense of um like do you feel altered on stage do you feel like you're somewhere else yeah yeah <laughs> cool okay uh, <laughs> great that's all <laughs> yeah and I'm forever grateful and uh to be to to have to be able to inhabit that space yeah. to go to that other place and um, you know to look to my right and to see these guys and to see um, the songs take form especially in the front row of the audience that I can see and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah yeah it's a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Danny, I'm, you're next. D D Danny is disrupting the class from the other side of the room. So, um, hello, is it on? Okay. Well, maybe one of I your. I handle this differently. <laughs> I've made everybody up. Here's my. Here's Rob, my. I can tell that story better, by the way. But, really? Yeah. Do you have some edits? Huh? We'll get if you have edits, What's we can get to those at the end of. Uh, Robin, did our you session. send a picture when you uh, sent your package to audition? I know I heard about the Betamax in the <laughs> library, but can you talk about the picture? If I, I maybe might have. <laughs> he very wants to leave off the record, so never mind. Wow, that's that's a little bit hard to Ask leave on the table, the but okay. <laughs> so, Danny, would you like to talk? No, um, I. <laughs> Now that you have the microphone. Um, so as everyone who's here probably knows because you would have read this, but when these guys were first inducted, there was, um, you guys all wrote like a little something that went by your photo and, and uh, on the Nine of Shells message board and on the Rock Hall site, I think. And you wrote, um, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but this, these are your words. In 1993, I joined my favorite band, Nine of Shells. And I thought that was both cool and sweet, and I am inviting you to true. speak more about that, and it's true. Okay, tell me, I mean, that's like the, that's what came out when you were asked to think about this. Talk about that a little bit. Um, well, I, I was into all the same stuff that this, the dark stuff or whatever, <laughs> but, and Al Jorgensen Ministry, all the mm -hmm. wax tracks, Chicago, and, um, mm -hmm. but like, 
aesthetically got into all, like in Neubot and all the cool sounds, and I didn't understand how they made that kind of music. Like synthesizers are expensive and shit. I'm Corpus Christi, Texas, you know, not wealthy enough to pay for, you know, and I couldn't understand how they made that kind of music. And but they never had like except for ministries, they have like some like hit type shit, like anthemy kind of stuff. And then my friend's like, dude, you gotta check out this fucking Nine Inch Nails, bro. And, like, and it, I, <coughs> he's like, they worked with a guy from the Cocteau Twins and Flood and, you know, all the producers who were like, tripped me out, go Keith LeBanc and Adrian Sherwood, uh, people who had worked like on ministry and things like that. And um, This was in Texas? It was in to, Texas. Okay. And um, at the, long story short, I love Nine Inch Nails, basically, when I discovered them and, and uh, go to their shows and shit. And um, I was like, man, this they, they got all the cool sounds, but they got s- hits and pop songs or mm-hmm. whatever. And um, I don't know if it's cool to say pop songs, but whatever you would call Trent, that. Trent, are we okay with... He could okay. sing, like, actual <laughs> melodies or whatever. He didn't go... <laughs> you know, and, and, but he had all the music that was doing that. And, so, and, and it's like Depeche Mode on Angel Dust. And, and so... Wow. Okay. But, but eventually, like, so I was in that little world of all those people I knew. I, I worked with some of those guys and stuff eventually, which were, like, heroes of mine. And then uh, I had a mutual friend of Trent's, and uh, I had, and this isn't what you asked me, but I got the mic, so fuck it. And so they, Go for it. But so I just remember I was in Texas and uh, kind of finishing up college, and I had a mutual friend of his, and I was like, oh, man, if you talk to him anymore, see, like, I'll guitar check, I'll do anything. I just want to go out there and, like, hear the music all the time and blah, blah, blah. And... She gave me his manager's number, John Mom, who's from Cleveland. And I left a message on the machine. I only had a pager at the time. And um, Monday morning, it was on the weekend. On the Monday morning, I get this fucking 216 number. And I'm like, whoa. And I had to find a pay phone. And I had this little <laughs> fake thing to like make fake, uh, you know, blue box to make like, uh, what do you call it? Pirate phone calls. I'm going, is this making sense? Am I AD, oh, wow. AD ding out too much? And so anyway, it happens to be the actual weekend that I called. I get this call back from dude. I, I hit him up, his manager, and he's just like, "So, uh, what do you what do you know?" I'm like, "Nothing. What do you mean?" And <laughs> this guy had just like left the band to start Filter at that um, it, like that weekend, basically. And that good was the timing, I guess. That's yeah. what she said. And, and so like, <laughs> the, and but they basically I, I fucking got lucky as fuck, and it's been getting lucky all the time, and I've been <laughs> clutching to his coattails ever since the end. <laughs> Many potential follow-ups to that, <laughs> including why you're carrying like some sort of pirating device around in your pocket for to disguise phone calls. But I mean, you don't have to. Uh, yes, anyway. Um, I was living in a car and I was like set up to sell a toe to science. Like I was doing those these guinea pig experiments. Got it. Where okay. you, you go in there and pay a hundred bucks a day. You get all. You know, you have to. I was gonna say all you can eat, but you can't. You gotta eat like a specific <laughs> thing. There's a control in a study group. It's science, guys. And okay. So. Uh, He's but you live ma- for free. He's not making that up either. No. Yeah. He, he was gonna sell his toe. That was his next plan. I, is Thirteen that the grand, number bitch. One organ. Yeah. <laughs> free trip to England. So yeah, and all my shit in my car, sleeping on couches and stuff. So uh, you didn't ask that question, why? I think it's important that you make clear to the audience that not maybe you drugs. are that you're not advocating for toe sales as like a way of dealing with debt issues. I mean, maybe you are, but I I would sort of take that from part of what you're saying at the moment. So, but lab rat experience is really good if you're a fucking loser and you don't want to work. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you can play guitar the whole time too. Oh right, it's efficient. You can bring what you yes. want. They got video we games. We used to live together. You two live together. <laughs> uh, Robin almost lit a house on fire during uh, the earthquake in L.A. Uh, go on. He, because he's like, he acts all quiet. How weird is it too that he's all like shy, but you see him on stage and you're afraid of him or like, <laughs> but. We, we uh, the, when that earthquake happened in 94 in LA, we got back to this apart we were all living in, and um, he, I'm tired, I go back straight to sleep, and this guy's like, light some incense, and has some candles going, and blah, 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 and, you know, satanic experience, the whole fucking building starts to fall down. We're outside, and this fucking asshole just lets candles fall up against the wall, doesn't, you know, do anything about it, and... Mm. 
So yeah, so, we were roommates. He tried to kill me. Did you continue to live together after this? I bet the answer is yes. He's not talked to me since, actually. And, <laughs> yeah. Robin, would you like to um, respond to these comments? We would get up in the morning and get in the, uh, the van that would take us to the rehearsals. There was two seats in the van. Sean Bevan would drive the van. I was in the passenger seat with my brand new boom box with the two cassettes listening Sweet. to rehearsals from the night before. And he was rolling around in the back with the shag carpet. <laughs> <laughs> like a kidnap victim or something. <laughs> okay. Not doing your homework, not listening to last night's rehearsal or, but yeah. Okay. I'll run this game, bitch. Got it. Okay. Okay. Got it. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anyone else who lived with Danny on this stage that I should know about? Any other? Oh, Chris is like, don't look at me. Okay. He's um, the most together guy. He's a professor. He was my roommate on tour. Okay. He chose me. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Wow. I feel like I should say let's switch gears for a minute, but I don't know if I can recover from that. Um, but you I will. just changed my diaper back today. <laughs> I believe that. I fully believe that. I'm wearing a fresh one. I'm about to fill it. Okay. <laughs> Ew. This is, this is like the point where whenever you're, as a woman, interviewing dudes or spending any time on the, on the bus, is, this is where you're like, like day three or four when they get comfortable with you, you're like, Oh wow, yeah, no, this is I'm out. Like I need my own ride. This is boy, dude talk has started. But you know, I appreciate That's illegal now, you know that, Nurse. right? Okay. You can't Nurse. bro down with girls anymore because so you get in trouble. Okay, so I wanna ask, speak, st sticking somewhat with I think the same era, although I've sort of lost track of exactly where we are, but Charlie. Um, yes, you sir. Um, I think it, it's either in the homework assignments I made you all do before we came here today so I could see what you wanted to talk about or in some other part of your writing or speaking. You spoke about, um, in 1994 on tour, you operated the Hotel Room Portable Studio. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, you're regretting having told me that. That's fine, but yeah. you did. So I, I, I mean, that's returning again to the theme of just what if you love this band and this music, you fantasize is actually going on in these key eras of Nine Inch Nails magic. Um, talk about that. Like you're on the road, you're playing shows, and then what, like every hotel room is also, like every day off, every night, like what was that? What were your responsibilities? Well, this was before I was in the band, I was just a hanger on at that point. And you know, I came into Trent's world from a background of being a studio whiz kid and mm -hmm. I could work the computers and the samplers and all that stuff mm -hmm. before that in the the decade prior to even finding him I had been in bands and had record contracts and publishing deals and none of it caught fire and it was all pretty lackluster so by the time I wound up in Los Angeles where I first met him I was kind of done with trying to be in bands and mm -hmm. I, I wasn't Good, I wasn't a good musician at any particular instrument. I could fumble around on drums and guitar and keyboards, but you know I wasn't like th on the level of these guys. Um, so, but Trent pulled me into his world because I could move really fast on the on the gear, mm. which at the, in that era the gear was much more crude and fumbly and expensive and silly and slow than <laughs> what we have now. Yeah. But so that. I wound up going on the road with the band before I was in the band. This was when James Woolley, may he rest in peace, mm. was, yeah. you know, he was the keyboard player in the live band. And he and I became good friends on tour and uh, because we were kind of in the same area of expertise. Um, and so what I would do is I didn't have, on gig days, I didn't have anything to do except watch the show, <laughs> which was fantastic because I got to see Nine Inch Nails yeah. Night after night after night, at in in the a fantastic era, in the, you know during the self destruct tour phase, which was you know the full fog machines and unravelled videotapes and <laughs> smashing keyboards and cornstarch and just the full strength mayhem. Cornstarch? Yeah, yeah. Come on, okay. y'all know, y'all know. Yeah. No, that's secret. Just checking. And uh, so I got to watch the band over and over again and just soak in. You know, it's a different when you're on the stage. You don't have it doesn't have the same impact yeah. as when you're in the audience. And so, and then when there was a day or two off, um, I would 
to unload these stacks of gear. Now it could be just a laptop or two, but yeah. back then it was, you know, big chunks of gear. And I'd load them into some extra hotel room that, that Trent had set up, and we would, that's, in that phase, we did the comp, comp compiling of the soundtrack album for Natural Born Killers. Yeah, amazing. For which uh, also uh, Trent did an original song and also a, an adaptation of a couple classics. Um, and so we kind of would do that, catch as catch can in these moments of, of hiatus where there was three or four days off. Mm -hmm. And uh, then eventually when uh, sort of, I guess it was about a month or two after uh, the legendary Woodstock 94 gig, James was like, you know what? I'm out. I'm done. Mm. And, there, and Trent was like, you're up. That guy. Let's go. And, yeah. and I was like, I kind of had to explain to him, dude, I don't, I've never played keyboards in front of people before. <laughs> and he's like, eh, you'll be fine. Uh, and he was right, but it was, you know, a baptism by fire. Because I had been a drummer uh, in, yes, in yeah. numerous terrible bands. Um, and I wasn't good enough to be the drummer in Nine Inch Nails by a long shot. Um, but... My first performance ever playing keyboards in front of people was with Nine Inch Nails. We did one kind of pickup wow. gig. It was here in town. It was in the flats. Um, do, do you remember what club that was? It was at the Odeon. I remember you pushing Trent off the keyboard and like letting him. I'll take that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, happiness and slavery, that's first mine. First gig, I'm going to be the yeah. front person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and then the second gig was at uh, Palace at Auburn Hills, which was like, I don't know, 12 or 19,000 people or something. And so it was a baptism by fire. No kidding, but, uh, yeah. It was, what a way to jump into it, you know? I like the idea of um, private keyboard playing, too. Just, you know, this is not <laughs> something we do in front of other people. Yeah. This is no, something no, no, we no. do. Oh, yes, no, no. absolutely not. There are certain things, yeah. But I did have good training after watching the bands on all, yeah. all these shows across Europe and then through the fall. And so, uh, you know, I didn't think that, okay, that's, that's my spot. I'm up next. But uh, that's how it transpired, mm -hmm. and you know, all credit to Trent for having, the, the for being daring enough to say, "Yeah, go ahead, step in." <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? Right? <laughs> this. <laughs> um, one more thing for you, really, is just maybe this. Maybe there's nothing here, and I'm trying to draw too many connections. But I have obviously been thinking a lot about both all of your relationship with the phenomenon of Nine Inch Nails and also everything that you're doing outside of this band and in your other creative outputs. And so do you think, I mean, when you work in the film world or the TV world or and any other sort of, like your work, a lot of your work has a lot of sort of taking somebody else's, um, something they're trying to conjure and then giving voice to that in a certain sense. Is that like, or is there a connection there? You know, in turn, cause you, you had this experience of, as you're saying uniquely, I think observing Nine Inch Nails for a long time and then being a part of it in a, in a different way. And I'm wondering if there's any sort of relationship between those, that practice at all. Um, I'm probably not so much in terms of the process yeah. or the influence, but the, uh, the one thing that attracted... I mean, Nine Inch Nails was the only band I ever wanted to join. It wasn't like I was going to go right. searching for bands in <laughs> s that needed a keyboard player or whatever. Um, and what attracted me to it was just Trent's sense of the uh, otherworldly or cinematic or a whole soundscape and way of approaching music that is outside of the boundaries of making records. Totally. And that, there's a common thread there, perhaps, yeah, between totally. the way he approaches writing songs and making records and working in the studio and the stuff, the way you can approach a similar situation when scoring for film where the boundaries are off in a distance somewhere and you're not constrained by, uh, you know, verse and chorus and how long will the guitar solo be and yeah. that sort of thing. And so that freeform aspect, both yeah. in the way the structure of his music and the content, both the form and the content, those are when both of those things are so free and wide open, that's what attracted me to working with him, and that's what attracts me to working with film scores yeah. in the same way. Makes sense. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, speaking of cinema, um, cinematic stuff, Alessandro, um, we <laughs> hi. <laughs> 
Well, we were just talking in the green room a bit about your honestly really enviable sounding life in Portugal and um, and and just beauty and the type of music you're making. Even we spoke a bit about like your work your work in for Fendi or doing figuring out how to make music on your own that works in a lot of different contexts and and that sort of I don't know brings. That that yeah that brings t brings uh, sound to life in places that um, it's not that standard to have sound. Um, and so I wanted to start by asking you just about about that work. About you kind of have this. You're here. You're in Cleveland, Ohio. You're touring the United States right now with Nine Inch Nails. Um, but you and you also have this you know this other world that you're really involved in and that's a big part of what. I would imagine occupies your creative brain on a daily basis. And so my question is really, how do you do that? Like, how do you keep, do you, do you, are you sort of like, no, I'm doing Nine Inch Nails right now and that part is turned off or are they related to each other? Like, how do you think about those two spaces? Well, I wish it was two spaces, but oh. I don't even think <laughs> 400 there's 400 spaces. spaces, yeah. Um, <laughs> I really kind of stopped thinking about what's gonna be next or uh, how can I rationally put what I do to service to make you know, I don't want to say money, but like, you know, monetize mm -hmm. what I'm good at. And the moment that I stopped thinking about what if or what's going to happen, and I started doing it for myself mm -hmm. um, without getting too new agey about it, but what's, what started happening is that whatever made me happy sonically and emotionally mm -hmm. somehow um, filled up a space that I didn't know existed in me. And by consequence, it found you know, spaces and roads that uh, I didn't know existed. Like the Fendi thing wasn't a necessar necessarily a com uh, conscious decision to get into fashion. <laughs> right. I had some friends that ended up in that world. Uh, they introduced me to, to that family and uh, it was an extremely positive, you know, series of uh, collaborations and uh, always new as well. It wasn't the same thing over right. and over. Not and repeating like yourself. Just the last one, I had the pleasure to do it along with Mary Queen. So it's always cool. a new thing, you know, yeah. and it's exciting. But it seems silly, but I always say I never had to sit down and think about what's going to be next, not mm -hmm. because it showed up, but as long as I take a, a breather, uh -huh. something comes up. You something know? It's, is It's next. more about not doing stuff and, and mm -hmm. coming up with the, then coming up with the next move. But Yeah, that's... Um as you're saying that, I'm like, I really should get better about doing that. <laughs> that sounds really like a pretty ideal way to create. Um, well, there's always an emphasis in trying to think about what I'm going to do next. Yeah. Or how can I use this to be this? Always. Or I see them doing this. And we all do it. What all, can I make out of this? How yeah. can I turn this into something? I think something? it's a yeah. normal process. Yeah. But I think you reach, a, you reach a point where you go, you know what? What do I want? <laughs> you know? um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's I'm taking that one home um, as advice, essentially. But I also I do want to ask you about your audition for Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. <laughs> well, very simple. I saw a flyer for yeah? a guitar player. Where, and keep where did you see the flyer? In a cafeteria at, at a music school. Oh my God, that's really yeah, yeah. just. Crazy. I was teaching. I went do, down. Do you think Trent was there earlier, like posting him off himself with thumbtacks? No, I think it was a service. Like there was an individual who took care of auditions and was hired by management and. Um, I saw a flyer and it said for keyboard player and, and guitar player and I tried to audition for both and just like Robin said it was just him or just me on you know on uh -huh. the stage with uh, playing over the recorded version uh -huh. and I think I did uh, wish both on guitar and I brought my little Nord modular keyboard <laughs> where I created the sounds myself super stoked about it. And, uh, and then the other one was closer, so I had all my different patches on the keyboard. <laughs> so that was the first one, and Trent wasn't there. It was the first, like, the semifinals, I guess. You know? Right. Or quarterfinals. But, and there were, you know, plenty of people that were much more capable than I was on the instrument, as, as keyboards or guitars, or both. You did know? you but, audition for both? Or did you, like, did well, you play Well, the songs that were asked yeah. for me to play had both parts. Okay, okay. So for the ones that I felt confident enough to, to cover both, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were more songs the second audition. The second audition was, I remember it being like this, like I remember Trent and everyone walking in and sitting down in the dark, Ooh. and then there's me. <laughs> and not a keyboard player, you know, a, as a yeah. background. That wasn't really my background. I remember uh, one of the songs was uh, The Frail, The Wretched, and so the live version, and I had to play on top of Trent playing The Frail. 
I remember clearly having to ask, like, could we just skip this? <laughs> you did? I did, because, I mean, one thing is you practice it at home, and it's a, you know, a combination of blacks and whites, and you sort of memorize, because I'm not even thinking about the notes that I'm going to play. I'm just going to say, all right, this first, and then the other one. But then you have to do it in front of, you know, the guy who wrote it and everybody else with him. So I'm just like, you know, it's probably safer to say I'm going to skip it. How did, how did that go over, Trent? Do you remember this? Do you remember him asking to he, skip Here it? he is. <laughs> yeah. Some, some went well. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about was at some point, again, in kind of preparing for this, you said there's a line somewhere that you wrote about Trent's knack for finding talent, like uh, that that's something that you have noticed in him. Um, and I think obviously just based on everyone who's on stage right now, we can see that. But w if you have anything to expand on with that, I think that's really interesting. Because there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of really talented creative people, musicians and otherwise, who you don't have to have that to do, to make something beautiful or cool or, you know, world changing. But when you do also, when you have that sort of like personal ability to express yourself in a unique way and then also the ability to see that in other people, that's a pretty potent combination. And I thought that was interesting. I'm not, I hadn't heard that before. So if you have anything to add to that, I would love to hear it. Well, I think as it should be, a lot of emphasis is put on the, the musical abilities of my colleagues and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that is not stressed enough is also the personal, like the, the persons that we have, the, mm -hmm. the relationships that we had or we built and evolved over the years, you know. Um, yeah. I think that's just as important as what we do as musicians because I've seen plenty of musicians being great at what they did and lasting a week. Totally. And, uh, or others not being able to adapt, you know. For me, it's fantastic to be able to be in a, in a family like this where one time, one tour, you, do, you play a specific instrument and then, hey, how you feel about evolving or changing your position from this to that? And I mean, how many jobs right. allow you to reinvent yourself and feel like it's always fresh and, and at the same time get room to sort of express yourself? So. Yeah. Just jump in for a sec. Please. You know, I, when I think of cultivating talent, like to me, Frank Zappa is someone who cultivated talent. You know, I hadn't really thought about audition with you guys for since it happened. And, <laughs> But thinking about it now, you know, it, it's not to discredit anyone's musicianship, because obviously that is a big part of it, but it's about people that you want to hang out with or that feel like the right recipe of personalities. You know, and I remember having a talk with Rich Patrick. First shows, you know, I'm playing Terrible Eye. It's not D, E, whatever it is. I totally remember. It's that. fuck. You. That's right. You know? Fuck you. Exactly. And, and I mean that because it, it wasn't about hitting the right note even. It was about the, the point of the band was to help articulate the message of the music, mm -hmm. you know, and convey it the right way. And looking at all these guys, I love all you guys, you know, and we and I felt like it's all felt like uh, over the years, you know, it got weird at times and things have changed, and but it was... Um, you know, Robin, as soon as, you, as soon as you showed up, we knew immediately that you were the right guy, you know? And, and everybody sitting up here. Anyway, that's no, my don't, little... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, that's awesome to hear. And I think, you know, you, lots of bands forget that part, like that you're going to be living with these you're people. You're stuck with them. Yeah, kind yeah. of. <laughs> if you can't imagine... Uh, the sort of like alchemy of the personalities working like that that's just sort of an afterthought um but it's pretty key why do you think some of us aren't in the band anymore <laughs> <laughs> hey you're here though you know that's pretty impressive um i got <laughs> secrets <laughs> we have the secret section coming up in just a few minutes where you just you know vent no um <laughs> so <laughs> oh god so actually this brings me to yeah you, <laughs> look at him Look at Alana. He just got it. He's like, nope, this is why I have this hair. She can't see me. This won't be happening. She's not going to talk to me. Well, but you are, we spoke a bit about this before, in a pretty, we're having all these conversations about the sort of early history of Nine Inch Nails or being in Cleveland and roommates and all this kind of shared past stuff. And obviously you've been in the band for a long time, but 
your perspective is different um, in that not just sort of in terms of like where this band comes in your story versus where it came in everybody else's story by the time you kind of got there. And um, yeah, I mean, just sort of open floor to you to speak a bit, I think about, this is part of why you're at the end of this part of the conversation, but um, what does it feel like to hear all of this? You know, like, do you, I mean, these all these stories that are being told by your bandmates, but also that you weren't there for, but also have heard about, like, what's that like? It's interesting for me because I joined, well, I auditioned at the end of 2008. Yep. I joined officially in 2009. And obviously the band's been around for a very long time and people change, especially over two, three decades, whatever it may be. So when I hear these stories, <laughs> I mean, I can picture Robin being exactly the same <laughs> 25 plus years ago. That makes sense to me. But other stories that I hear, I kind of can't, see that personality in the people who I know or have mm. recently met, just because time changes people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, hopefully that answers your question. By the way, I like no, the I whole time. No, I want you time. to name exactly who you see. No, just kidding, go on. Well, yeah. We can talk about Danny for ages, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we can, yeah. By the way, I like how two hours ago when I was telling you to kind of gloss over me or keep my section short, you tortured me for 51 minutes. I did. Just letting me You know, stew and initially, until here. you started messing with me earlier, yeah. I was like gonna get your part done quick. I was gonna yeah. be like, ask you total softball and just be like, isn't it great? Nine Inch Nails, dream, right? You know, mm -hmm. and you were gonna talk a little bit and that was gonna be the end of it. But mm -hmm. then we had some time in the green room and you were yeah. messing with me and making fun. me nervous yeah. and there you go. <laughs> He's right. the youngest member to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah. It is cool. Yeah. I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there were other parts of your question that I didn't get to. So nope. if you could rephrase them, I'll, I'll tackle them I can. bit by bit. I can rephrase all day. All right, um, go for it. Okay. Well, actually, I'm not going to, though, because I have something else I want to ask you. Okay. Um, was there any hazing? Like, any. I mean, come on. Like, when you got into your like kid brother, I don't know. Like it just from the outside again. Maybe that you guys are like that's a stupid question. She doesn't understand the culture of this band at all, and maybe that's true. But I just I I have to ask that. Honestly, zero. Because guys, by the time Trent, by the time I joined the band, wrong era. Everybody wrong era. Everybody were just beautifully matured gentlemen by the oh, time dear. I joined. See, I so, was believing your answer until that. I, I swear to God, and mm. you know what's funny is that I know this sounds ridiculous, but I joined the band when I was twenty, yeah. And I got a, I was fortunate to get a very early start in music. So, although twenty is young, by that time I had been in my fair share of bad bands, one more unprofessional than the next. Mm. And by the time I made it past the audition stage and showed up for the first rehearsal, and I just saw the pristine professionalism in the way everything operated. I was like, finally, I'm around people who know what they're doing and they're doing it great. And I just felt like I was finally at home with like-minded people. So that was, that's the way I felt. Wow, yeah. okay. I'm a little disappointed, I gotta say. Um, it, maybe it's not too late. Have you had your, what anniversary is coming up for you in the band and maybe we can, anyway. Um, oh, I have no idea, but everything has been good. <laughs> you know, okay, good. I've, I think I only had to dodge one mic stand in um. my, my 14 years. <laughs> only one. Yeah, only Chris one. is like, what? <laughs> yeah. You know. Were you ever tackled? Never tackled. Actually, never tackled. Sorry, moving Trent on. Made... Moving on. <laughs> Statute of limitations. <laughs> There is a show tomorrow, so <laughs> just putting it out there. Um, so um, Atticus, um, yeah, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, I best for last. Yeah, well, yeah, um, he's pretty great. Um, I wanted to ask you. You said something similar to some of the other, like just in your writing about your post about what it means to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is so beautiful and so well written, and it honestly kind of annoyed me. I was like, "What? He's like a great writer? Like, where? where when's your memoir coming out? Like, it's it's really, honestly, like really. I wanted to hear more, and it was also very kind of inspiring and thoughtful. Um, uh, you can keep going. Yes, and you're a genius in a number of other ways that I haven't even brought up yet. Um, 
but you talked about 2001 Space Odyssey. You talked about the idea of discovery. Um, and you talked about, and I wrote it down so it so would get it close to right. Um, yeah, the further one sails, the more there is to discover that idea as connected to, obviously, to your experience of being in Nine Inch Nails and these, all this, all this time spent in this band and working with Trent, obviously, on many projects. And I guess that really struck me as a pretty um, s s resonant way of expressing what I think a lot of people, certainly my, myself included, feels about how alive this project of this band is now. Like to be able to talk about it, we know it's this, not that it's the elephant in the room, but it's something that's really hard to do. Very few people are able to do this. Very few great artists are able to do this, to keep that sense of an edge, of a sense of like what's on the next horizon and to have that feel um, as alive now as it did then and, and, and yet to still be able to appreciate what the past offered. So that's a very long-winded and kind of academic way of asking, of saying that I liked what you wrote and I wanted to know if you had anything to add to that just in the context that we're sitting in right now. Um, well, first I wanted to say how much I've enjoyed listening to everyone today. Mm -hmm. I had some fabulous stories. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah. I mean, as far as that question is fairly simple, I think, and just um, one doesn't want to get bored. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, life should be interesting. And I feel like the more one, the more energy one can put into life being interesting, the more that comes back at you. And I think in terms of the studio and making records, there's a lot you can learn, but it's the stuff that's, you know, you can always fall back on this and that, but it's the stuff that's ahead of you that's the most fascinating. And I guess that, yes, but how do you, I mean, and maybe there's no like sort of concrete, and no way to actually explain this, but I mean, I've talked to both of you before about actual albums or specific pieces of music that you're working on. And I think, I think a lot of people understand that that's the goal, not getting bored. I mean, if you say like, I don't want to get bored, it's like, sure. I mean, everybody, well, I mean, you, you have to put, it? you have to like, put effort into it in terms of, I mean, actually physically putting effort into taking things out of yeah. the room that you have used okay. and putting things into the room that you haven't, that you don't know how it works. <laughs> and you may never know how it works, so that's but something how it works. will come like, out. Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, the, the sort of idea of you guys have been particularly good at that. And I think you really um, sort of pin down something about this band that you're all a part of that is unique in that way. Unusually good at staying true to some sort of uh, immediately identifiable, unmistakable aesthetic that's, that's specific to Nine Inch Nails, but also having this sense of just, you know, we kind of never know what's coming, <laughs> um, which is amazing. So... Yeah, and I think yeah. at the core is it's something that everybody t touched on, which is mm. isn't to do with music, it's to do with human relationships, mm. and that you can't really go forward um, unless those are intact and moving forward as well. Mm -hmm. And it's those kind of friendships and um, trust, I suppose, trust. that allows you yeah. to you know have some bad ideas. <laughs> You guys have bad ideas? I don't feel, I mean, we just don't see them, but they well, exist. We do. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you say so. Um, so last couple things here. I wanted to, to return to you, Trent, and just ask a bit about when you gave your speech uh, to the, to the rock, as, as accepting the, your induction to the Rock Roll Hall of Fame, you said, um, among other things, this journey is far from over at the end. So let's stop fucking around, patting ourselves on the back and get to it and hope to see you all in the flesh soon, which I th was, you know, sounds like you, sounds like something you would say. Um, and here we are. And at the beginning, you spoke a bit about, and I asked you a bit about this sort of, this dance between nostalgia, thinking about the past and being present in the present and also thinking about the future and how those things all relate. And I, you know, in, in the context of being here 
with this particular honor in mind, like where, and obviously you gave that speech a couple years ago now, or it was in, in, in that context at the beginning of COVID, where is your head about that right now? How does the future look and how does it connect to the past slash present? Mm. No, I feel pretty optimistic. You know, I, I feel, I, I want to acknowledge that I feel very lucky and blessed mm -hmm. and, and grateful that people care about what I do, Nine Inch Nails, et cetera. I feel that um, with getting into scoring and doing some of the things, it's kept things interesting. Um, I always think about relevance of Nine Inch Nails and if, I, if, it, if it should be continued, and if so, how to do that. Um, and to treat it with respect, you know, the, it as a project. Um, if I'm going to ask for your attention, I want to. I want to guarantee you. I'm going to put everything into it to make it worthwhile and have integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not a constant. I'm getting older. I'm changing. My perspective changes, and I think trying to keep um, some perspective as to objectivity as, as to who you are, who your audience is, what this means to them, what it means to you. Does it still matter? If it ever starts to feel like it's going through the motions, mm -hmm. then it's time to not do it out of respect for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. um, and try to keep that as a, a, a kind of philosophy for the whole thing. As Atticus was saying, um, you know, the more we do things, the more creatively, the more we kind of feel like, well, there's a lot we don't know. You know? And I'm not saying that out of humility, it's out of wow, it's exciting to stumble into this thing where there's a lot to learn, and that feels exciting, and it feels childlike in some ways. Yeah. And I think that's important, where it, it never kind of pivots into feeling, you know, ho-hum, so. Or well-worn or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Optimism. It's wow. a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're basically out of time, but I, I did bring in a couple of questions that from that were submitted by um, fans online before this session. So I'm I'm going to read them off my phone, which is, <laughs> and there will be applause from the audience as I do this. Okay, um, and this is just kind of I think these are just sort of general. So if, if for anyone who has something to say, Danny, um, that will, will uh, if, if this, for anyone, these, these are what for anyone. What would you like really. to live with Danny Lohner? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, That's good. So, yeah, this is cool. Everyone takes their own meaning from your songs, and those meanings change. Oh, and I should just say before I finish reading this, that these are questions that were written and then got a lot of response from other uh, sort of people in this conversation. So these are sort of written by one person, but then part of a collective. Um, everyone takes their own meaning from your songs, and those meanings change over our lifetimes. Is there one song that has come to mean something very different to you now than when you first wrote it, and can you share that story? And of course, that obviously could, could be for you, Trent, but I, I think the reason I found this question interesting is also just thinking about that everyone on this stage has a relationship with this band and with the idea of this band, both as a member of it um, and as a kind of either a, a, an earlier fan or a follower of, or uh, has some relationship with the songs that are part of this story. So anyone have anything they would like to say in response to that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Trent, they were quiet for long enough, so you have to talk. No, I mean, for me, everything, it changes all the time. Yeah. You know, um, I think something that, Certainly through the 90s, every song was written from a place of, I wasn't writing music because I wanted to experiment with form. It was, right. I had to get it out. So it was coming from a place of um, desperation in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, and some of those when I revisit now or we think about what we're gonna play in sets or what we feel like playing. Sometimes a relationship, it changes from something that might have been felt scary or mm -hmm confessional and intimate to becoming something that's more, it just changes, you know? Like I, I was thinking, say a track like La Mer was written in a pretty bad place in my life where it was meant to feel like just walking into the ocean and, and extinguishing yourself fearlessly, 
Um, now it feels different. It feels like the opposite of that. Um, it feels redemptive in a way. Yeah. The end. <laughs> Okay, um, so this really is the last, the last thing, and this is uh, to be answered by anyone, but also to be um, answered on the behalf of anyone else. So if you want to talk about your bandmates, here's your chance. Um, for the band, do you have any pre-show pre rituals? And bonus is if you can say how long you've been doing that ritual. So, anybody? <laughs> Robin? Sorry. I didn't know. Do doctor, oh, he's got some. What? The doctor pants. <laughs> we. Did you guys hear we, that too? He said, do "Okay." <laughs> we read and reread the set list so many times mm -hmm. to where I start to forget what the <laughs> titles of the songs represent. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, visualizing. Uh, transitions um, and to the extent to where like I start to psych myself out okay. about songs that have been playing for 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> give or take, give or take. Uh-huh. Okay. Y'all don't listen to The Carpenters anymore before you go on stage? No. Wow. We haven't done that for a while. But that was like what I remember. It's like Carpenters Greatest Hits and Tequila. Oh. <laughs> tequila. Cornstarch, like they said. Yes. Cornstarch. Okay. Ten dog. So no carpenters, but okay. Maybe you. It sounds, Robin, like you need a pre-show ritual for combating your pre-show ritual. You know, like something to do instead of that, like cognitive behavioral therapy. Put something else in that. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Any rituals, past or present? Nothing. You guys are just so pro. You just, you just, you're like, yes, rock show. It's, it's what we do. Oh, I mean, God. back in the day, all it took was uh, Ice Cube, America's Most Wanted, on a crappy boom box <laughs> that was like that's, that's enough good. for me anyway that was, that was plenty okay. um well i think that's it that's all that's that's all she wrote you guys thank you everyone so much for being here today and thank you to thank everyone you. on stage yeah yeah